view the proud this morning. Monday morning. Man, there's a low energy level in this room, I think. Maybe it's a good day to stand up and stretch a little bit. Everybody stand up. All 10 people that decided to come to class today. All right, stretch a little bit. Uh, now, if I was a cruel person, you too, Jason. You're good. Let's stretch your legs or something. You know? Let's get some blood moving. All right. All right. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I was, you guys had good weekends? It's a good day to be in class. It's a good day to be in class. Maybe, uh, maybe as a reward for the people who decide not to show up today, I'll just have the midterm be entirely on material covered in class today. <laughs> entirely. It's like there was a. Uh, I, I don't know why not. I might as well tell a story. So, um, you guys know who Al Franken is? Al Franken, uh, uh, former Saturday Night Live writer, uh, current. Is he still a U.S. Senator from Minnesota? Yeah. Anyway, so he, uh, he graduated from Harvard and he, he spoke at my commencement. And he was telling a story about a class that he had had, I think it was in the morning, and he was doing some sort of show at night. And so he would, he would come to class and he would frequently fall asleep in class. Um, none of you guys seem to be capable of doing that, which is nice. And, and it's good you don't because I have special things planned for anybody who dozes off in this class. Um, but anyway, so, so toward the end of the semester, he was concerned about his grade, and he had also heard that uh, the professor apparently thought that maybe he was on drugs. Um, so he decided to, to address the situation by meeting, by meeting with the professor. Uh, so he went to see this guy, and he, you know, he, he went in, and there was some sort of anteroom, and he sat down, and, and it was really warm in there, and you can imagine what happened next, which is that he fell asleep. Um, so the guy came out finally and woke him up and was like, what's going on? So he explained the situation and the professor was, you know, very nice as, as we like to be. And he said, you know, well, the exam's coming up and the exam in this class was worth, I don't know, like 80% of the grade. And so he told Al Franken, he said, you know, the exam's going to be entirely on the readings. Right? He said it's going to cover nothing from lecture, just the readings. So, you know, it's still okay. You can still catch up. And so Al Franken was like, oh, thank you, thank you. He went, to the library and he spent like two weeks apparently reading all the readings for this class. And, and I don't know what happens at UB, but at least at Harvard, no one ever did the readings for classes. You know, I mean, maybe you might do 5% of the readings if you were lucky, right? Because they just assigned way too much to read. So, so anyway, but then he, he did have this thought in the back of his head as he was doing this, which is maybe this guy's messing with me, you know? Like he thinks I'm a drug addict anyway, you know? Maybe he's just really, really telling me the totally wrong thing. Maybe this stuff's going to be entirely what was covered in lecture. And but it turns out he showed up at the exam, and he knew everything. And he did, this, he did fantastic on the exam. And apparently, the, the professor was really angry, actually. He said, you know, you got the best grade in the class. And you're the person who comes to, to class and falls asleep all the time. So, so anyway, uh, hopefully that won't happen to any of you guys. Uh, but, but you're welcome to come to me and ask questions about the exam, and I will not make things up. Um, but today, we're going we're gonna to try to finish talking about um, about swapping, right? So, so last class we, we introduced the idea of swapping, uh, and we talked a little bit about some things that make, might make swapping work well, right? And one of the biggest challenges to swapping well is choosing the page that we're going to move to disk, right? So if we choose the wrong page, then we, we might do a lot of work and get very little reward out of it. If we choose the right page, the cost to benefit ratio can be very good, right? So we're going to talk today about specifically the components of the cost and the benefit. And then we'll introduce some algorithms uh, for choosing pages that will probably feel familiar to you guys. So when we looked at scheduling algorithms, we talked a little bit about tricks or general principles that we play when we're trying to predict how resources are going to be used. And those come back and apply again today when we talk about page replacement. Okay? All right, so there's a couple announcements today. The first is that the, the midterm is Friday. Uh, there are some of you that will take it Thursday because you're going to be out of town. Uh, I'm going to write a separate exam for you guys, which will be so much harder. Oh, just kidding. It'll be pretty similar. Um, but so on Wednesday, we're going to review in class, right? So I, we've been getting questions to the course list about the midterm, right? And I haven't been answering those questions. People have been asking things like, oh, well, can you send me a sample question? Well, there's a simple reason I haven't been answering those questions. It's because I haven't written the midterm yet. So I don't know what the midterm is going to look like. I've been thinking about it. Uh, and at some point very soon, I will have to write it so we, we don't, we don't uh, have a repeat of, of the preterm kind of 
disaster, right? So um, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards not giving a multiple choice exam, right? So it may be you know, three or four uh, short to long answer questions. What I'd like to see you guys do is, is take some of the design principles that we've learned in class. I don't really care if you guys remember the nitty gritty details of you know, the um, rotating staircase deadline scheduler. I just don't think that's that interesting, right? What I'm trying to figure out if you guys can do is take some of the principles that we've applied in class and apply them to new problems, right? So what you might see on the exam is a couple of design type questions that introduce you to a new situation and ask you to sort of um, discuss how you might apply some of the design principles that we've learned about in this class to those problems, right? So that's probably what you're likely to see on the exam. I just don't care if you guys remember what LRU stands for, right? I mean, this stuff is really easy to look up, right? Um, and so I, the, the test will be less about sort of like little pecuniary details of various things and more about trying to stress some of the things that we have emphasized over and over and over again in this class about how to do good design and how to write good system software, right? So any questions about the general theme of the exam? Um, all right, so yeah, was there a question? Somebody made a noise. Dachi. I'm not going to I'm not going to box myself in here, right? <laughs> I'm not going to take any options off the table, right? But but right now, no, there won't be any sort of. I, I, I'm thinking it will be a, it will be a better exam if there aren't fill in the blank and, and multiple choice questions, and and this will put more stress on me and the TAs, but they haven't had enough to do recently, so uh, we'll give them some more work. Robert. No, no, no. I, it probably it probably won't be that involved. It probably be more, you know, here's a, here's a problem, and can you identify some general principles to follow in solving this problem, right? So there's 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 things that have popped up over and over again in class, right? And we'll talk about some of these things on Wednesday. But you guys have heard these things over and over again, right? I mean, you've heard, for example, about separating policy from mechanism, right? This is a classic. Uh, systems design approach that allows us to write better software. So you may be introduced to a question that asks you, you know, in this particular case, given this particular context, what would be a way to do that, right? Or does this design successfully obey this design principle? So it's going to be more things like this, right? We'll cover this more on Wednesday, right? I don't, I don't want to spend too much time today on. Um, so I assigned everybody a partner over the weekend, right? And at some point, I just broke down and got tired of you guys waiting to find a partner, and I just assigned you, people who didn't have a partner, I assigned you a random partner. So hopefully that works. Please contact the person that you were assigned just to make sure that like, they're a living, breathing human being and not some sort of like, you know, cyborg student that's been sent to like, test hub or something, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. Right, yeah, I need, yeah we need to talk. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure this out. I'm kind of hoping that there's at least one more person who's in that situation so I can, I can link you guys up. But, but it, it, if we have an odd number, we'll figure out what to do about it. Right? There are classes that we, we have approaches to this, to, to solve this problem. Um, so the assignment to design documents are due on Wednesday night. Um, there's no set template for this document. We just want something that is PDF format and under two pages and reasonably formatted. Okay? I think I can say that. And if we get stuff that's like in six point font, um, then we're not going to read it, right? So if it requires like a microscope to read, or if the mart, like if the, you have like quarter inch margins or something, then we're just not going to read it. So you guys know what reasonable is, right? I mean, to, to get to non-reasonable, you have to break a bunch of things in Word, right? And like click OK to a bunch of warnings, right? So just don't do that. Um, and I think that's it, right? Oh yeah, there's one last bit of assignment too that we're going to release this morning, right? That's, that's just about uh, setting up code sharing between you and your partner and shouldn't have slowed you down to this point, right? OK, any other questions? Maybe it slowed down Isaac, because he's way ahead of everybody. All right, so let's talk about the stuff we talked on Friday, right? Friday, it's like such a long time ago, right? So questions about swapping, right? Anybody have, anybody be, was there anybody who was thinking about this all weekend and just burning with the desire to ask some sort of really uh, key question about swapping? Maybe nobody remembers what swapping is after the weekend. All right, so what is the goal of swapping? So I guess the, the first question, which is not up on the slide, is, is why, why do we swap? Why do we swap? Let me start in the back, right? Why do we swap? What, why? why? Like, what, why even bother, right? The disk is really slow, so why would we move data to the disk anyway? Uh, not sure. Not sure. Over here. Uh, it's based on memory. 
memory is not in, uh, is not enough. But, yeah. we're, so we're, right, we're trying to create the illusion that there's more memory on the system than is actually present. Right? That's the goal. That's, that's why we swap. Right? We, you know, swapping is not required. It's optional. Right? But when we ran out of core, if we weren't able to swap, we would just have to start failing allocations. Right? We'd have to start not letting programs execute or having to, to fail malloc allocations within uh, a program. And, and usually programs don't deal with that very well. Right? So, so we'd like to be able to relax this requirement that we can only allocate as much memory as the system actually has. Right? Now. When we do swapping well, right? When we swap well, the goal is that the system feels like it has memory that is what? Right back here. Uh, slow. Slow. No. no. So, <laughs> okay. So, so the memory is fast, right? So, so we want mem we we want we're going to use both the memory and the disk, but we want the system to feel like it has memory that is what? As big as disk, but at the same time. As fast as memory, right? That's the goal, okay? Memory is fast, right? Disks are slow, okay? Now, on the other hand, if we don't do swapping well, what could the system feel like? Jason, it has memory that is what? Um, I guess it, as small as RAM. As small as RAM and at the same time, as fast as the disk or as slow as the disk, as we'll, as we'll say, because the disk is slow, right? What do I do with my water bottle? Ah, there it is. I shouldn't walk around with this. All right, so this is our goal, right? What do we need to do in order to swap a page of memory out, right? So remember, pages 4K of data, right? Typically, maybe 8K. I'm gonna, I, I wanna, I've decided that I have a page. I want to swap it out to disk. What do I need to do to make that happen? Let's start over here. Alex. Right. The first thing I have to do is remove the translation from the TLB and all the TLBs on the system, right? If I don't do that, it's possible that the contents of the page will change while I'm in the process of swapping it out. All right? What's the next thing? Uh, copy, the contents of the page to disk. copy the contents of the page to disk, right? I've got to store the contents. If I don't store the contents, the next time the process tries to use the page, it's going to be disappointed that all its hard work that it had dumped into this 4K of memory is now lost forever. All right? What's the next thing I need to do? Hmm? Yep? Update the page table entry. I could tell where you were going with that. You said update, right? That's right. Update the page table entry, right? Operating system has to keep track of where the contents of this page are. When the page moves to disk, the page table entry has to be updated to, to reflect that. Okay, awesome. What, so, wait, hold on. Do I have, uh, don't look. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, these are out of order. All right, so, so what can we do? Well, what can the system potentially do to increase the speed? Swapping out requires that I do this really slow disk I.O., or does it? What can I do to increase the speed of this operation? Anybody? Anybody? Right, so while the system is idle, what am I going to do? What's that? I'm going to, well, it's not really swapping because I'm not removing the page, right? But I'm going to copy the contents of the page to the swap disk, right? So that when I'm on the swap out path, I don't have to actually write the data. I can just remove the page and update the PTE, right? So this is, this is the goal, right? And I, if I can do this while the system is idle, hopefully when it comes time to allocate memory and I need to swap out pages, I've got a lot of clean pages around, meaning that the page matches the contents on disk, right? All right. So another grab bag question. Operating systems, when do we typically load the content, right? So when I, when I start up a process, it calls exec. It tells the operating system, here's how I want everything laid out in my address space. Right? I've got this big blob of code, and I want it right there. Right? When does the operating system usually actually load the data into memory? When, you really need it. when I really need it, meaning when the process actually uses that page. Right? So the operating system will make notes. It's, it's kind of like if you, were, if you were designing a house, right? and your architect wrote down exactly how, the, how you wanted the house to look, and he's like, oh, right, OK, you want a room this size. But until you walked up to where the wall was, there was no wall, actual wall there. Right? He was like, I'll put that wall in when you're going to notice it. Right? So until you kind of were about to bump into it, he's like, OK, stop. He frees you, build the wall, and then you can continue going. Sorry. So this is, this is what we're going to do. Right? We're going to make notes about where things are supposed to go and where they're supposed to come from, but we're actually not going to move any data into memory until absolutely necessary. Right? And, and why? Right? Why, would we, why would we want to avoid 
loading in data until the pages are used. Right, because there's a lot of stuff that never is used, right? Especially a lot of code paths that the, your, your uh, executable may never actually go down, right? So we can avoid loading that code until it's absolutely necessary. But on the other hand, I want, I want just to explore the fact that there's a trade-off here, right? So what, 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 what problem does this cause, right? The, the benefit is that it's potential that I can save a lot of memory by not loading memory until it's needed. But what's, what's the downside of on-demand paging? Right, there's a delay now, right? Because when the process actually sees or uses the page for the first time, I've got to stop it and go get it, right? So I'm making a trade-off here. The trade-off is that I'm going to avoid allocating memory until it's absolutely necessary, but when it's necessary, I'm going to take a little bit of a penalty, right, in terms of extra latency. All right. So we have to swap in a page when that virtual address is used, yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll get to that today, actually, right? But, but in, in general, right, so, so here's, a, here's a great question, right? What, what makes a play page clean, right, according to this slide? What do I do that makes a page clean? Right, and, but what do I do to, to make that happen? Right, when the page data is copied to the swap disk, at that point the page is clean. When does the page get dirty? When something writes to it, right? Now, how do I tell? OK, remember, I have virtual addresses. I have the TLB. I've got access permissions on my virtual addresses. How would I tell that, an, that a process has written to a page? How would I know this? How can I use hardware to help me, right? What's that? Well, well let's, uh, let's say I have a bit in my page table entry that I'm trying to update, right? But how do I get hardware to tell me when the page is written to? No, no, but, but, but using the mechanisms that we've already defined. You, you guys are thinking about how to store this state. I'm saying, how do I know? How do I get a trigger when, this, when, the, when the page is written to? Essentially, yes, right? So what I, what I can do, right, and what you guys can do on your OS 161 system using your MMU is that I can load an entry into the TLB read only, right? So one thing I might do is I might load, when I load a page into the TLB, if I want to track when it's being written to, right, I might load it if, if the address that, if the instruction that causes the address to be loaded into the TLB is a load, right? If it's a store, I know it's dirty immediately. Right, because I'm immediately writing something to that page. If it's a load, on the other hand, what I might want to know is, is the, does the process ever actually write any data? Because right? it's possible that this is a code page that's never written to. Right? Or it's also possible that this is a data page that just happens to be read-only, right? that the process doesn't actually do any writes to. So what I can do is, the first time I load the entry into the TLB, I can load it as read-only. What will happen after that is if the process tries to write to it, I'll get a separate exception, right? So the TLB on your system has a read-only exception, which means that there is an entry in the TLB for that virtual page number for that process, but the process is trying to do a store when you've only allowed it to do a load, right? So that mechanism allows us to see when pages are being written to, right? If the TLB didn't have this feature, I would just have to mark it dirty whenever I loaded the entry into the TLB, because after that point, I have no idea what the process does to it. Right? The process could do stores, the process could do loads, but I don't see the mixture. Right? But if I have an ability to, to load things into the TLB read-only, then I can distinguish between pages that are only read from right? and pages that are written to. Does that make sense? OK, I don't have a slide for that. But. All right, so when do I need to swap in a page? Right? So I have, again, when the virtual address is used, the operating system had better make sure that that virtual address looks like memory again, right? regardless of where it is. Right? If it's on disk, then what do I need to do? What, what, what are the steps here? There's more steps than there were before. Start in, we'll start in the back. What's the, or we'll actually we'll grab back here. First step, what do I need to do? I hear mumbling. Right, I need to stop the instruction from executing, right? The instruction can't execute until I've restored the virtual address to something that looks like memory, right? 
it, because right now it doesn't point anywhere, right? It just you know, points to some on, you know, part of the address space that's not actually valid, right? All right, so what's the next thing I'm going to do here? What's that? Right, so, so and there's a couple of things that happen kind of in parallel here. The first one is that I need to allocate space for the page, right? So I need to find a page in memory to hold the new page contents. Now, what might this require? Swapping out, right? If I'm, if I'm low on memory, if I don't have any pages to use, any pages sitting around, I might actually have to remove a page in order so that I can swap in a page, right? So the next thing is I need to locate the page on disk. I use the information that I stored in the page table entry when I swapped out to do this, right? What's the next thing I need to do? I found the page on disk. I have somewhere to put it. Copy it, Copy it in, right? Copy the contents of the page from disk, OK? Three more steps. Update the page table entry, right? Because the next time, if I fault on this page again, I need to know that it's in memory now as opposed to on disk. I've moved the contents. Load it in the TOB. And finally, restart the instruction. Right? Now this instruction can proceed. Any questions about this? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it, hopefully, when we get to step two, there are either unallocated pages or clean pages around that I can use. Right? And as we said before, a lot of times operating systems will try to keep some reserve of, of completely unallocated pages around at all times. So even when the system has a little bit of memory left, it's constantly going around to processes and pushing some of their pages out to disk. Right? So it's kind of saying, OK, here, what's, what's a page you haven't used for a while? OK, I'm going to put that on disk for you. So it's constantly trying to do this background bookkeeping. Because when you launch a process, right, there's this massive spike in the number of pages that the system might need to use. Right? And if I don't have much memory left on the system, I've been kind of trying to let everything expand into all the available space, then when I launch something, I've got to do all this stuff to get all that, to make enough room for this new thing. Right? So it's really, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's really the fact that you launch processes and that creates this huge discontinuity in the number of pages that are in use. That's the reason for keeping some sort of buffer around. Right? And we do that by gently trimming processes over time. Okay. Any other questions about swapping? So we reviewed swapping. Uh, we're going to talk today about how we pick that page to swap. So any other questions about the mechanism? Right? This is another mechanism versus policy split in operating systems. Right? Really, everything we've talked about up until now has been mainly mechanism. Right? How do we translate virtual addresses? Right? How do we move content between page and between, sorry, between the disk and memory? Right? Today, now, like we did with threads, we're finally popping all the way up to the point where we can talk a little bit about policy, right? So let me, let me, before we go on, let me just introduce a useful piece of terminology that's important for you guys to understand. There's two little bits of grab bag stuff in here, and then we'll get into page replacement, okay? The first thing is, normally we use two different terms to distinguish between two different kinds of virtual memory-related faults or exceptions, right? The first one is called a TLB fault, right? And a TLB fault is what it sounds like. It means that the TLB doesn't have an entry for this virtual address. Right? So the TLB doesn't have an entry for it. And the way I address a TLB fault is by loading an entry into the TLB. A page fault, on the other hand, is, is a little bit more serious. A page fault means that either the page is not in memory, the contents of that page are not in memory, or the page might be uninitialized. It might be a, a new heap page that the process is using for the first time. Or in certain cases, it might be that the process is trying to allocate an address that's just totally, you know, as they say on car talk, bogus, right? I mean, you know, some sort of bizarre faulting address, and the result's going to be that I'm going to kill the process, right? So, you know, three things can trigger a page fault bogosity, uh, swapping, and new pages that haven't been initialized, right? So as you'll see, on some level, every t page fault is preceded by a TLB fault. Right? T page faults are essentially a, 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 a superset of TLB faults. Right? On the other hand, not every TLB fault creates a page fault. Right? If the page contents are in memory, then I can satisfy the TLB fault without creating a page fault. Right? OK. And, and the reasons for this are, again, if the contents of the virtual page are not in memory, I can't have a translation that points to memory. Right? So there's no way. If I have a page fault, that I could have I could have put an entry into the TLB, 
right? There's definitely not an entry in the TLB. However, if the page is in memory and I have a TLB fault, it's possible I can satisfy it without raising a page fault, right? The reason why this is important to understand is that there are architectures that actually allow hardware to assist the operating system in the process of managing the TLB, right? What we've been talking about in this class when we've been talking about TLB management, we've talked about loading entries into the TLB, we've been talking about the operating system doing that, right? So the operating system actually being involved, you know, an exception occurring, the operating system taking control and putting an entry into the TLB. On some systems, there's this further optimization, which essentially says that hardware can walk the page tables, right? So hardware can look up entries in the page table. And if there's a valid entry in the page table that points to a physical page, hardware may be able to load that into the TLB without ever trapping into the operating system. Right? So, so what, what do you think the pros of this approach are? Right? So essentially what happens here is that we've been talking about every TLB fault triggering a kernel exception and the kernel taking control and handling it. Right? And what I'm telling you is that on some systems, the only time the kernel gets control is when there's a page fault. Right? TLB faults are handed transparently by hardware. Right? So what's a pro of this approach? It's fast. Right? Again, we can avoid the overhead of trapping into the kernel and having to you know, save all the exceptions, stay, you know, wake up the kernel, whatever else. All these, all these instructions that have to be executed every time there's a TLB fault. Right? So, so the pro, are, pro is hardware is clearly faster here. What are some of the cons? What does this mean about hardware? So, so, okay, so we can change the algorithms, but what, what can't, what, what do hardware and software have to agree on here to get this to work? Right, and, and specifically what interface? What, what data structure does the hardware have to understand in order to get this to work? The page tables, right? So remember the whole lecture we had where we had all these different approaches to different ways to, to implement page tables? If you tell the hardware, this is how page tables are set up, you're stuck. Like the hard, hard, hardware is dumb, right? Or, or hard, hardware is like a certain kind of smart person that only knows how to do a few things really, really well, right? But it's completely inflexible. So essentially, the page tables have to be set up in a way that the hardware can understand. Because the hardware is going to walk them without ever involving the operating system, right? So, so the x86 architecture, for example, is one architecture where the page tables are actually accessed directly by hardware. Right? Meaning that the operating system doesn't get control unless there's a page fault. Right? And again, as I said before, with a hardware managed TLB, the operating system does not see TLB faults. This is the whole point. Right? The whole point is that I let the hardware understand the page tables. It can find if, there's a, if the page is in memory and there's a an, an, an mapping in the page table, hardware can find it without interfering with the operating system at all. Right? And it, the hardware will only alert the operating system if it looks in the page tables and doesn't find an entry, right? Now, on the other hand, one of the reasons that we've been talking about, so, yeah, Calvin. Um, so for this kind of system, does a uh, kernel just tell uh, the hardware what tape, like what process is running? Yeah, I think, it, yeah. I, yeah, so, so I think, if I remember correctly, and, 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 and my, my former advisor, Matt, has a great lecture he used to do on the, the x86 memory management architecture, which we may or may not do after spring break, I haven't decided. It's, the x86 is really disgusting and gooey, right? So it's not, it's not a fun thing to talk about, and I think it ends up being really confusing. He does a really good job of actually simplifying it as much as possible. But if I remember correctly, right, exactly. Remember, I have a separate page table per process. And so on context switches, I think what the operating system has to do is at least tell the MMU, here is the, here's the address of the first level page table for this process, right? I think the x86 uses um, a two or three level, multi-level page table. And so the idea is you have to tell the hardware, here's the location of the first page table. And then after that, hardware can walk it itself, right? But exactly. So every time I have a context switch, I need to update the hardware with a little bit of information just so it can get started walking, right? And once it, it does that, the rest of it works, right? G great question. All right. So as I point out on the bottom of the slide, don't worry. One of the reasons we've been talking about this is that your system, OS 161, has what's called a software managed TLB, right? So you get to set up the page tables however you want, and you will see every TLB exception, 
right? The, the hardware is not going to help you here at all. And this is a good thing for your purposes, right? Because it gives you more flexibility in designing your, um, your page tables. Maybe it's not a good thing, actually. It probably is a good thing. If, if you had to debug hardware trying to walk your page tables, you'd probably go insane, right? Because there's just very, very, hardware probably wouldn't give you much visibility into what you were doing wrong, right? OK, so, so again, in, in, order to, in order to actually swap out a page, right? We need to find a page to remove, right? And, and we call this process, sometimes we call it swapping out, sometimes we call it page eviction, right? It means a page is being evicted from memory, right? I'm, I'm throwing it out on the street, OK? Um, in order to swap out a page, we, need to, we definitely have to choose which page to move. And frequently, like I said, swapping in or creating space so that I can swap in also requires choosing a page to move out, right? Especially once I get to the point where I have what's called memory pressure. Right? So memory pressure means that the application's combined application usage of memory is more than what will fit in core. Right? So at that point, you have a machine that's under what's called memory pressure. Right? If you put 16 gigabytes of RAM in your machine, you may never have memory pressure. Right? But if you have you know, 2 gigabytes or 1 gigabyte, you might be under memory pressure all the time. Right? All right. So and, and on some level, making a choice about what page to swap is the operating system trying to optimize this cost-benefit calculation, right? So what are the costs of swapping a page out? Anybody? There's a couple of different kinds of costs involved here. John. Right, so this is slow, exactly. I've got I've, time, so it's essentially time and time, right? Time and bandwidth, right? So I've got to stall some sort of process for long enough to, to, to move the data to disk. And also, I'm doing I.O., right? So if any of you guys ever had a system that's, so we'll come to this in a few slides. Have you guys ever had a system that's just been really unresponsive, and it's sitting there, and you can hear the disk going constantly? It's like, you know? So that's what's called thrashing, right? And thrashing is, is something that happens, we'll talk about it in a few slides, but that means there's so much memory pressure, and the system is doing such a bad job of allocating memory that the disk is kind of going constantly, right? So I, I may be actually saturating my disk bandwidth trying to keep up with all the page files, right? Time and bandwidth, OK? Now, what's the benefit here? What do, what do I get from evicting a page and moving it to memory? Dachi? Then you're freeing up your um, RAM, so to say, and then whenever you need like, these pages to be loaded, Mm -hmm. Right, so, so as specifically as I could put it, the benefit is I get to use one page of memory, 4K of memory, for as long as that other page stays unused, right? So I throw a page out, and as long as the, out, as the process doesn't use that virtual address that points to that page, I've got some extra memory I can play with, right? So again, as long as the page on disk remains unused, I've got an extra 4K of RAM, right? So for a specific page, this is the cost-benefit calculation. The cost is the I.O. and the time. The benefit is I get some extra memory. And again, the benefit is time-dependent, right? The benefit is I get to use that memory until the page is used again, right? All right. So on some level, Optimizing this cost-benefit trade-off, we could do two things. One is that we could try to minimize the cost, right? We could try to reduce the cost of doing this. And there are a lot of tricks that operating systems play to try to minimize the cost. For example, I might try to set up my swap partition in a way that allows me to do the I.O. required to move pages to disk more efficiently. Okay? That would reduce the cost a little bit, and that would reduce my cost-benefit ratio. But mainly what we're going to try to talk about today are algorithms that focus on maximizing the benefit. Right? So again, I can improve this by minimizing the cost or maximizing the benefit. Most of what I try to do is maximize the benefit. Minimizing the cost is mainly some sort of clever engineering tricks that try to reduce the, the overhead of the I.O. that's required to swap. Right? All right. So a complementary description of this goal, which is way at the bottom of the slide, sorry, is remember I talked about page faults, right? So page faults happen um, when the page, uh, if a page is on disk, that will definitely produce a page fault, right? And on some level, another goal here, a, a complementary way of describing this that you'll hear about sometimes when people talk about these algorithms, is minimizing the page fault rate, right? So if I'm generating lots of page faults, it means that I'm spending lots of time moving stuff back and forth to disk, and I'm slowing the system down. Right? If I can minimize the page fault rate or reduce the page fault rate, it means that I'm doing less I.O. 
and, but under the same conditions, the processes are actually able to use memory that is in memory and, and operate faster, right? All right, so thrashing. Let me just, just, just talk about what happens when things get really, really bad, right? So, so thrashing, as far as I can tell, and according to Wikipedia, it doesn't really have a, a, a scientific definition, right? But you, it's one of those things like, like uh, the famous Supreme Court justice said about pornography, right? You know it when you experience it, okay? So thrashing, right? And you guys have probably experienced thrashing, right? It's a colloquialism. And it describes a computer as virtual memory system is in a constant state of paging, right? A paging is, is a synonymous term for swapping. Rapidly exchanging data in memory for data on disk to the exclusion of most application level processing. This causes the performance of the computer to degrade or collapse, right? So some of you guys have probably had this sort of thing. I remember once somehow I launched a fork bomb on my machine at work, right? Accidentally, not on purpose, right? Uh, fork, we, we talked about fork bomb before, right? Fork bomb is, is something that causes an exponential increase in the number of processes on the system. And, you know, within 10 seconds, the thing was just sitting there, you know, and eventually I think I had to, like, unplug it and, you know, turn off the power to most of uh, eastern Massachusetts to get the thing to come back up, right? Okay. So, so anyway, this is, again, this, 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 this is when things really, really get bad, right? If we do a bad job of choosing pages to evict, we, the system will thrash hard. Right? And, and you will essentially be forced to shut it down and start over. Okay? So, okay, so, so again, how do we maximize? The benefit is we get the use of 4K as long as the page stays on disk. Right? So how do we maximize this benefit? Right? What's the one thing that we can control here? What's the one thing that we can maximize? Using the page that is not to be used again. Maximizing the amount of time it takes for that page to be used again. Right? So exactly. Right? We want to pick the page to evict that's going to remain unused the longest. Right? This is the goal of these algorithms. Okay? So, so first of all, just let me point out, there's, there's one little corner case here. So we, we talked about this last class. What is like the dream page of a page replacement or a page eviction algorithm? What's the, a page that will be never used again. That's like, oh, that's, again, that's, that's, the, 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 that's the thing that these guys dream about at night. Right? If you could only figure out which pages the process was never going to use again, right? then that would be great. Now, I, I was thinking about something when I was preparing these slides. So why, why doesn't the process tell the kernel, hey, I'm done with this page? Right? Are there First of all, interesting question for people who have been working on assignment two, are there mechanisms to do this? Is there any way for a process to surrender a portion of its virtual address space? Yeah. No, no, but I'm saying, what, what, what's the interface that I would use to tell the kernel, like, this page will never be used again, right? There is one that I know about. Does anybody know what it is? Does anybody, did anybody implement this for assignment two, if you've gotten way ahead? So I think S-break can also, it can extend the breakpoint, but it can also reduce the breakpoint, right? So S-break, I think, allows the process to return memory, right? So I can ask for more heap. Or if my allocator is clever, I might actually tell the kernel that I'm, I'm not using some of that heap. But in general, these mechanisms are few and far between. And I would argue, what do you think the reason for that is? Why, why aren't there these great interfaces allowing processes to tell the kernel, oh, I'm done with this page? Well, OK, so that's one problem, right? There's, there doesn't seem to be really be a, a benefit here to using that interface. But what's a more fundamental problem? What's that? No, no, no. Let's say I can only free pages in my virtual address space. So I could just tell the kernel, this page in my virtual address space, I'm, I'm not going to use again. Right? There was a, I think there was a. Well, OK, so the kernel can't trust a process. I can certainly use it as a hint, though. I can say, well, if it told me that, then maybe it's right. I would argue the more fundamental problem is processes don't know, right? Like, they, they just don't know. They don't think about this, right? They just say, oh, give me more memory, more memory. Like, oh, wow, all this code is so great. Like, there's, there's no mechanisms in system design for even expressing this, right? Like, processes just don't have a clue, right? So, so it'd be, but it'd be interesting to think about, can you, can you do this well, right? Would there be a way to, to either write this into the compiler at some level so that you had some hints that a process could give to the system about things that it was done? Right? But I think that that would be so hard that it wouldn't be even, we, we would do better by guessing. Right, which is kind of what we're going to do. All right. All right. So, let's let's. So, you guys remember when we, we did scheduling algorithms? One of the things we talked about is what do we want to know about a page? Or or when we did scheduling algorithms, it wasn't pages; it was threads. 
right? So, okay, so okay, it's, it's interesting, right? So when we talked about scheduling algorithms, we talked about threads, we talked about priority, we talked about their usage of resources, how long are they going to run before they yield or block, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if I could predict the future, paging is a little easier, right? What would I want to know about a page? No, 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 no. If I could predict the future. Isaac? I mean, you want to probably have a rough idea how many times it was accessed. No, 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 no. No, I've got my crystal ball, right? What would I like to know about a page? When it's going to be accessed next, right? If I could predict the future, right? And I, could t and, and, and I knew that this page isn't going to be accessed for another two hours, right? Whether this other page that I'm considering is going to be accessed two minutes later. Then I'm done, right? Then this is easy. I order pages by the length that they're going to stay out, and I just I remove them in that order. Right? And that's, it's really, really easy to see that this maximizes our cost-benefit calculation. Right? The, the, the cost is the same across all the pages I'm considering, and the benefit is the greatest the, longest, the longer the page stays out of memory. Right? Because for all that time, I get an extra 4K. Right? So this, you know, again, like we said with thread scheduling, this is the optimal schedule. We think about this as an optimal schedule. It's not realizable. Right? But it's a good metric to use when you think about comparing different approaches. Right? Say, OK, well, how a lot of times in systems research, what we do is we construct an optimal approach, and then we compare our approach against the optimal. Right? And if you can show that the optimal provides a hard bound, and your approach gets 95% you know, of the optimal performance, then you're doing pretty good. Right? OK. This scheduler is difficult to implement. That's an understatement. It's impossible to implement. Right? You, you don't, don't have no crystal balls. Right? OK. Back to one of those classic system design principles, right? One that I think I may, maybe we'll see. I drilled into your head a little bit more insistently than some of the other ones. So when we can't predict the future, what do we do? Use the past to predict the future. And again, when we can't predict the future, what do we do? Everybody together. Use the past to predict the future, right? So again, this is, on some level, this is all I have. All I have is the past. Right? I'm just living with my memories about what pages did. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right? So on some level, doing intelligent page retracement requires solving three problems. Right? First of all, figuring out what about the past do I care about. Right? That's, that's problem number one. The second problem is figuring out how to collect statistics or track information about that thing, right? about that characteristic. And the third thing is, how do I store that information and access it appropriately? Right? OK. So now, now, now what could happen here? Right? So, so essentially what I've said is I've said I can't predict the future, so I'm going to use the past to predict the future. But I need to know something about the past, so I need to you know, keep track of them, some things that are happening. Right? If I don't do this well, what could happen? Right? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make an intelligent decision about which page to evict. But what's the trade-off here? Right? What, 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 could, what could start to overwhelm my system if I'm not careful? I want, I want somebody on that side of the room. Guess? Back? No? Anybody in this area? You have a guess about? What's that? Well, let, well let's say, I, let's say I, can, I can do a better job of picking pages, right? but let me give you guys a hint. So if I'm not careful, just the process of collecting this information has its own overhead. right? And if it slows down, let, let's say the process of collecting information requires that the kernel translate every virtual address every time it's accessed. Well, now I might as well not have a TLB and an MMU, right? I'm, I'm in big trouble, right? And, and the system is going to be so slow that your users are going to be begging you not to be so quote unquote smart. They're going to say, just do something dumb, right? You know, you're, you're, you're killing me, man. All right, what about storing statistics? What's the other problem with storing statistics? Memory, Memory right? I mean, this, this might consume a lot of space. And again, if I consume so much memory storing statistics that I don't have enough memory left for the things that the process is trying to do for the data that the process is actually, that's actually visible to processes, then th this thing falls down. Right? So, th so these, these, these are, these are my, my trade-offs I have to be careful. I have to make sure statistics collection is lightweight and storing statistics is, is compact. Right? OK. What, uh, back to our scheduling algorithms. Who remembers? Simplest possible page replacement algorithm. I need a page to evict. I've got some pages that are in memory. What's the simplest way to choose one? Random. Choose one at random. I just pick a random page, OK? So what are the pros to this approach? Very similar to schedule, process, thread scheduling. 
it's like no overhead. Simple, no overhead, no state to store. You know, it's great, right? And here's the other thing I want to impress on you, even if we don't get any farther today. Random algorithms, right, are frequently also great tools to evaluate your clever approach, right? Because you may think, man, I've got this great idea for a page replacement algorithm. I'm gonna, I write all this code, and I'm going to you know, collect these statistics, and I've got these really clever, I'm going to use like a, a, you know, some sort of uh, artificial intelligence learning, online learning algorithm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if it doesn't outperform random, or if it just barely outperforms random, then forget it. Right? I mean, ra random is, is, is usually a good baseline. I mean, the, the, you know, it's, 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 you know it, it's, it's the worst you can possibly do, but it, it gets the job done. Right? And again, what's the con here, which I basically just said? Maybe we can do better. Maybe. Right? It's, it's, it's a potential. Right? This, this actually doesn't use any information about the past. Right? It just makes a decision completely random. Right? All right. So. Who, who can get ahead of me a little bit? And so again, my approach is random doesn't use any information, but I want to use the past to predict the future. That's, that's my mantra. Right? That's, that's what I do. So what information about this page's past could potentially be helpful to, 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 to uh, keep track of? When it's accessed, right? How, how recently has the page been accessed, right? And so least recently used, right, or LRU, chooses the page to evict that has not been accessed for the longest period of time. Right? So if I knew this about the pages on the system, I order them and I say, OK, this page hasn't been touched for an hour. Right? That page is probably, that page may never be touched again. Right? But that page is probably not super important, so I'm going to move it out to disk. Right? Again, there's no guarantees here. Right? The process may be about to use that page. You know, maybe like, oh, wow, I haven't touched that page for an hour. It's time to get back to it. Right? And, and you're moving it to disk. Right? So there's no guarantees, but, but this is the, you know, maybe the best we can do. Right? And what we're hoping is that pages that are cold, right, quote unquote, that are not being actively accessed may stay cold. Right? That they may not be accessed again in the future for a while. All right? So what are the, pro what are the pros to this approach? I mean, this might be as good as we can do. Right? At some level, you know, there are more clever things that we can potentially think about doing, and, and there, are, there are more sophisticated approaches here. But on, on some level, you, on a page-by-page -page basis, without incorporating more information, this is probably uh, close to the best that we could do. Right? And, and what, what are the cons here, though? What, what does this require the system do? So there's two problems here. Right? First is, how do we tell how long it's been? Right? How do we tell when a page is accessed? And second, again, how do we store how long it's been? Right? So we need to do two things to implement this. We need to tr somehow be able to figure out when the page is actually being used. Right? And we also need to store that information somewhere. Right? So let's talk about how we collect statistics. Right? We talked about this a little bit earlier in class. At what point does the operating system know for sure that the page is being accessed? At, at what point do I know for sure? Right? A TLB fault. Right? A TLB fault is the TLB telling me, hey, kernel, this process tried to use this virtual address. Right? So at that point, I know for certain that there's an, an a, a instruction that tried to execute that was referencing something on that page. Right? So at that point, I know for sure. Now, on architectures where the operating system doesn't see TLB fault, what I usually need to do is rely on the hardware to help me store this information. Right? Because otherwise, when pages are in memory, I have no way to know what the process is actually using. Right? But when I have a TLB fault, I know that the process access an address on that page. Okay? Now, what does that not tell me? Right? Let's say a process starts to run, and it generates a bunch of TLB faults at first because it's page entries into the TLB. And then you know, 10 milliseconds go by, and another process starts to run. Right? What, what two pages can I not distinguish in the set of pages that the process used and that I loaded into its TLB? So can I distinguish between a page that was used once and a page that was used a million times? No. no. All I see is the first page access. After that, the accesses are completely transparent. And that's the way I want it to be, because I don't want to have to stop the kernel every time 
a process accesses a page. And even hardware data collection at this granularity would potentially be expensive. Right? So I want those translations to complete immediately and let the instructions execute. Right? I don't want to keep track of this. Right? And, and again, I just told you why. Too slow. I cannot record every page access. Right? That would be infeasible. And it's also not clear that the, the benefit from this would be really that high. Right? Now let's talk about storing data about the page access. Right? So you know, how do I represent time in the system? What's that? A timestamp, right? And what's a timestamp? It's a number, and, and what are numbers? It's a series of bits, right? And the more bits I have, the more time information I can store, right? But imagine I try to st store like some 32-bit wide timestamp for every page on the system when I load it into the TLB, right? Remember, our page table entries used to be 32 bits, right? Now they're 64 bits, right? So in one fell swoop, I've doubled the size of my page table entries, right? It's not clear that this is going to be a win, right? What I could try to do is, is take some subset of the bits in the TLB, sorry, in the page table entry that are unused and jam a timestamp into them. But now, you know, again, now I've gone from two to the 32 ticks of granularity where a tick could be, could be any unit of time, right? As long as it's the same. Now I have 256, right? So that's potentially much smaller, right? So there's a trade off here between the width that I use to store this information and the granularity, right? Final question before we break up for today. How do I find the least recently used page? Right? So now I'm in the algorithm, and I've got physical pages on the system, and I've got, I can, you know, and, and actually one of the out data structures we'll have to design for assignment three is a way to map from physical pages to page table entries. But let's say I can access all the page table entries for those physical pages that are in the, in the system, that are in memory, in core. How do I find the least recently used page? I've got to design some sort of gnarly algorithm, right? Like a heap or something that allows me to, to store this so that I can really, really quickly find the one that has the longest, the least recently used time, right? The longest period of time since it was accessed, right? So this is another challenge, right? I need some kind of efficient data structure holding all the physical pages, and I have to search it on every eviction, right? So this is potentially fairly expensive, right? And it could be hard to get right, all right? So let's see here, what time is it? All right, so let, let, me, let me just get through clock LRU and then we'll be done, I promise, okay? So clock LRU is a fairly simple and stripped down, what I would, I would call it, it's an LRU-like algorithm, right? And clock LRU is nice for two reasons. First of all, it only stores one bit of usage information. No timestamps, just one bit. And the second thing is that it stores pages in a very efficient sort of linked list data structure that it searches on each eviction, right? And here's what clock does, and I have a picture to show it on the next slide, right? So I arrange all the pages in physical memory in a fixed order. Maybe I just go by physical address, right? If the, when I'm locating a page to evict, what I do is that if the access bit is clear, right, if the access bit has not been set, I evict that page. That's the page I choose. If the access bit is set, I clear that bit, OK? When do access bits get set? Does any, can anyone remind me? When I load it into the TLB, right? So when I load it into the TLB, I set the access bit on the page, right? And this is how this algorithm works, right? So let me show you, right? So the reason we call it a clock is we think about a set of page table entries or pages that are in physical memory. The green ones I'm using here to show ones that, where the bit is clear. Right? So these are pages that have not been accessed since the clock hand came around last. So my clock hand starts here, and what do I do? What do I do with this page type? This one has been used, so what am I going to do to it? I mark it clear, and I go on. Okay? What do I do to this guy? Evicted. Right? So the first round of my algorithm, that's the page I choose to evict. Okay? What happens the next time I run the algorithm? Which page will I evict? The next one here, and what will I do to these two? Mark them as clear, right? So I, I walk through here, I mark these guys as, as clean, and then this guy is the next one I marked as clean, and I throw that one, okay? So I will come back to this 
Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do this very, very quickly again on Wednesday before we review, because I want you guys to see this. But this is essentially the end of the material for today. I will see you guys on Wednesday for midterm review.